Hi folks, StylePoint here. Today I'm going to implement the k-nearest neighbors, aka the knn model. I'm going to implement it from scratch in Python using only NumPy. So let's do this. Now I already have the testing code ready, so once we're done implementing the model, we're going to be able to test it. So let's first imp import NumPy as well as define a class called knn. And let's think about the API for this class. And to do that, let's take a look at the name itself, KNN, right? Of course, that stands for K-nearest neighbors. And it's almost like the name itself, the model name itself, uh, gives us hints about what we should use here as uh, field names or the parameter names uh, to properly initialize the, uh, the model. So K-nearest neighbors. So it's like, how many nearest neighbors? Well, the K number of them, it could be like two nearest neighbors, five nearest neighbors, 10 nearest neighbors, and so forth. So certainly, k is one of the variables, one of the field names we need to initialize. In addition, we can notice that knn, of course, is the uh, supervised learning model, which means that we need both the features and the labels. And that's actually all we need for this model, um, as far as the uh, field names go. But you may have already noticed that I have this you know, the data class style of initialization, which of course means that we're going to import the data class decorator from the data classes built in module. Now, to elaborate on why I prefer using data class here, um, there are several reasons. Number one is that it eliminates code duplication. So um, if we were to use this double underscore init method, we would have to write self that features equals features, self that labels equals labels, self that k equals. So we have that code duplication. Another thing is that in this case, with KNNs, we do not really have a very complicated initialization logic, which means that um, there's not much that's, uh, that would happen in init other than initializing these. In fact, there would, there would be nothing other than pretty much uh, uh, initializing these uh, variables. Um, another thing is that um, you can notice that we have these type annotations here. In fact, if we remove these type annotations, the data class, this, this code would not be valid. And that is actually a good feature of data classes, I would argue, because I really love type annotations for in functions. Uh, and uh, it's not very uncommon when we see the, um, the init magic method, you know, the double underscore init double underscore method that uh, um, has all these maybe in this case features labels and k but does not have uh, um, type annotations for any of the any of the uh, parameters any of the formal parameters that it takes and um, that's just not a good practice um, especially uh, for maintaining the code especially if, uh, if one wants to find more bugs in a code um, now i hope we're not going to have any bugs here but um, linting is something that uh, um, is uh, a more powerful, I guess, uh, the type checking is more powerful in statically typed languages. Python is, of course, dynamically typed. It's duck typed, but um, having other tools assist still is, I think, a big win. So um, these type annotations are awesome. Um, finally, it also provides some other like perks. Like, for instance, we can make this frozen. Frozen means we're making the data that the class KNN holds immutable. And that can be cool, especially for things like, uh, especially for users who use Jupyter notebooks. As we all know, Jupyter notebooks, uh, you're pretty, you're not, you're pretty much very flexible on uh, um, how you're going to run the code cells, right? Uh, Jupyter is very liberal about um, how you're going to execute uh, uh, the code cells, and that can be a problem, especially when um, when uh, people forget that they have something defined. Uh, two code uh, uh, two code cells back, but they use that code cell to also initialize something they want to use in the future, and therefore they're overriding some values, not realizing they did that, and and that can lead to problems. But if we do frozen not true, at least we prevent like one layer of like, uh, or we prevent one kind of approach, one way of over overriding things where you would not be able to say, okay, I define knn, and then you know say knn that features equals something. Once it's initialized, you won't be able to reassign it. So that's another perk that you have. So some of the things like that, and it also uh, generates codes for us, right? This data class um, decorator is just a code generator. So it will also um, generate things like wrapper for us. So if we uh, wanted to print out KNN, we could do that as well. 
So I just wanted to elaborate on some of the uh, reasons we're doing that. Uh, we're using the data class that created. Uh, okay, and of course, it's also more readable, I would argue, especially if we have uh, more fields. If we were to implement something like linear regression and we would have like features, labels, epochs, learning rate, logging, and so forth, then if we just line them up this way, like horizontally, it would probably, you know, go go over this line I put for myself, which is like 100 characters limit. So anyway, these are some of the reasons. Um, other than these fields, we just need to initialize, uh, or we just need to define the um, method called predict that would basically perform inference using the given, um, using the given features. And that's actually it for the uh, KNN uh, model, the KNN class. Like how awesome is that? We need these, you know, three things, and then a predict method to generate predictions. One thing, that, uh, one thing I'm going to note is that the features here, those are different from the features right here. Uh, these are like the testing features, and these are like the training features. I did name them, I did give them the same names, right? It's features and features, and these are like generic names. But I'm going to defend that decision and say that it makes, it's, it's kind of more readable and makes more sense, and here is why. Um, for the KNN, if we call this, uh, features, um, it kind of, I mean, as far as the KNN itself is concerned, this features is features. It does not really know that these are training features. If we really wanted to annotate this, we could have said, uh, annotate meaning that we could put like a comment in this case, not type annotate. Um, we could say, okay, comment, this is like training features and comment is like, these are like the tr test features, right? The testing features. Uh, but I feel like that m makes more sense to give them the same names. Um, of course, some people may disagree with that, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's like uh, the reasoning be behind, you know, calling them the same names. Okay, now that we went through all this, you know, uh, discussion uh, about, uh, you know, the data class and why we use that and why we gave them the same names, features, and so forth, and why we use the type annotations, let's now code up the predict method. Once we code this up, we're done. That's pretty much the KNN. Okay, so what does the predict do? Well, it generates the predictions. So we define predictions, we have some KNN magic happening, and we return those predictions. Um, well, the first question we ask is, well, how many predictions do we have? And how can we know that number? Well, we know that because we have the features here. And of course, the features is just uh, a collection of feature vectors. And in NumPy, uh, in this case, we would have like uh, two feature vectors. So that's num uh, two samples and the number of features for every sample would be three. So if we were to say num features here, if we were to unpack that as well, uh, that would be three. But we just put a throwaway value here, which is underscore, uh, because we're not gonna really use the number of features uh, uh, in KNNs. Um, so predictions, we can then initialize it to the uh, empty NumPy array um, of size num samples. And now is the time for that KNN magic. So we're going to go ahead and uh, iterate over, so index and feature in enumerate uh, features. We're going to iterate over the uh, all of the features. We're also going to use the index. This is because we want to populate the predictions uh, array. And it's a NumPy array, and it does not have amortized O1 complexity for append. So we have to like directly index into it for efficient efficient updates of the values, uh, for the values. Um, so how does the KNN work? Well, the way it works is that let's suppose we have, uh, I'm going to make an example. Let's suppose we have, uh, we have like two groups of, uh, of samples, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. Um, and we have like a new sample X coming in. How are we going to classify uh, um, uh, the sample, right? Uh, well, actually, let's put A4 there as well. Um, how are we going to classify basically this X? So this is like the training data, A1, A2, A3, A4, B1, B2, B3. And let's assume that A here corresponds to label A. So this is A1 has the label A, A2 has the label A, A3 has the label A, A4 has the label A. B1 has the label B, B2 has the label B, uh, and B3 has the label B. Um, so this is label A, and that is label B. 
uh, what the KN model is going to do is that it's going to find the distances for from X to all of these training features. So find the distance between X and A4, X and A3, X and A2, X and A1, X and B1, B2, B3, and um, uh, generate those distances, right? So generate those values. Then let's suppose these values are something like, uh, there are seven in total, right? So 1, um, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. Uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, in that case, we're going to uh, then sort it in ascending order. So basically, this would change this way. And then we're going to take the k smallest uh, 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 values. So in this case, maybe these uh, k is 3, and then it's 0 0.5, 1, and 1. And for these ones, 0 0.1, 1, and 1, these distances, we're going to find the corresponding labels. And maybe for 0 0.5 distance, it was between x and a4. And one, it was between X and A3. And this one was between X and B2. Then in that case, we have two A's and one B. Uh, we have more A's than B, which means we classify X as an A. We have more, basically, uh, uh, labels that are in class, more, more samples that are in class A than B. So it's like majority voting, pretty much, at that point. So that's how it works. And let's go ahead and implement this. So distances is going to be some kind of a distance function uh, that takes this feature and maybe like a train feature we can call it for uh, train feature in self that features now the distance itself is like a function that uh, calculates the distance between feature and train feature uh, and this distance function is very customizable it's like it depends on like a domain of the problem it depends on the kind of features we have it depends on uh, uh, modality of the data uh, but in this case uh, maybe we can go ahead and use like uh, the uh, Euclidean distance. Um, we, of course, could have used the uh, um, other uh, distances, distance functions. If we were uh, doing this uh, on the uh, um, uh, sentence embeddings generated by maybe one of the transformer models like BERT, uh, maybe then uh, we would use uh, cosine similarity or inner product. Well, if the embeddings are normalized, they would be the same. But... Uh, it, that would be another option if we had word embeddings or sentence embeddings. If we had some other problem, maybe we would have used uh, uh, Manhattan distance. But in this case, let's let's do the uh, Euclidean distance. And the way this works is um, we use the NumPy's Linalc norm and feature minus train feature, um, and that basically gives us the uh, the size of the uh, uh, the distance ba basically. Um, and to understand why uh, why that is the case, we can think of a feature to be like one of the points in n-dimensional space, and train feature is another point in the n-dimensional space. Well, we can construct a vector uh, between these two points, and the vector coordinates are computed by, you know, subtracting one from the other. In this case, it does not really matter what direction the vector has, so I just subtract the feature from train, uh, train feature from feature, and then we just find the norm, which is the size of that vector, which is the distance between feature and train feature. Um, the next step is really just finding that most common label. Um, so we can do something like k sorted uh, distances or indices, I guess. We can do arc sort, for instance. That's one way to do it on distances and get uh, k smallest ones. Um, and then we can get the uh, most common label by just counting them. We can use the uh, um, uh, bin count to count them, uh, which is pretty much part of like the NumPy module. Uh, we can do self.labels index for index in k-sorted indices. Now, of course, notice that, uh, and we take the most common one by saying argmax. Notice that um, we used arc, uh, not argo sort, arc sort. Arc sort, basically what it does is that it, instead of um, returning the values themselves um, in uh, ascending order, it returns like the indices of those values um, in ascending order. So uh, um, that's basically, well, the indices themselves are not going to be ascending or in ascending order, but the, uh, uh, if you were to index with the indices that it returns, you would get values in the ascending order. And that's basically it for the uh, KNN model. Uh, it's 24 lines of idiomatic Python, and we're done. Okay, so um, let's see what we have for the testing here. Uh, we have uh, Iris data set that I got from the uh, sklearn uh, um, package or module. Uh, the reason I like this is because it's like self-contained. We don't have to have like separate files and you know CSV files, JSON files, and so forth. And if someone wants to replicate this, 
they can just uh, run it directly. Um, so, you know, we have train features, test features, we have the test size, uh, we have the random states for reproducible experiments, uh, we have this KNN with like three labels, and, uh, sorry, with the three neighbors, and let's run this. And there we have it. So we have the accuracy of 0.974, precision of 0.979, recall of 0.967, and an F score of the 0.972. Um, and to just kind of make sure or verify that K is indeed like a hyperparameter or something, uh, let's let's try out some different values, like maybe 11. Mm, okay, 11, it's the same. It didn't change. It seems like 11 gives us the same results. Okay, what about like... Uh, 25 something like that would it give us the same result okay it didn't okay it actually went a bit down so every statistic every metric is worse here so this is something uh, we can play around with and in, in fact we could have written maybe like a for loop iterating over several k values and finding the best one you know uh, based on the accuracy pre precision recall um, it's not actually of course not necessary that every metric you know goes up you know there's always a uh, um, trade-off between preci precision and uh, precision and recall sorry and uh, uh, so in this case it so happened that they everything just got worse but not always um, so that's gonna be it for the uh, KNN model and I hope you enjoyed this I, uh, I hope um, this was maybe a bit helpful <laughs> and uh, if you have any questions uh, whatsoever or if you have any suggestions please feel free to comment in the uh, uh, comment section I'm gonna make sure to read them and uh, take into account for the future videos. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for tuning in, and I'm going to see you next time.